Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 141 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists. Today, our special guest is Miles De Castro, who is the repair technician for the Crane School of Music and also the owner of a store and repair center called North Country Winds. We discuss many maintenance and repair topics of interest to clarinet players, ranging from how to find a great technician and keep the great one that you do find, to whether cracks are truly the end of the world, the importance of preventative maintenance, and some handy items you should keep in your case in the event that you might need to do your own repairs at some point. Thank you so much to our 68 Patreon backers for helping make the show possible. They also get access to an ad-free extended version of this show, which you can check out at clarinet.com and clicking on the Members section. Also, thank you, of course, to our sponsors. Encoda is a new app that lets you stream, practice, and perform tens of thousands of sheet music scores. It's kind of like Netflix or Spotify, but for sheet music. Get a free trial today. Just search for Encoda on your device's app store. That's N-K-O-D-A. Imagine a read that offers complex performance and sound but is washable, recyclable, consistent, doesn't require moistening, and lasts for months instead of days. It's all possible with Leger Reeds, the world's leading synthetic reed brand made right here in Canada. Leger Reeds are used exclusively by some of the world's greatest clarinetists, including Eddie Daniels, Carada Giuffredi, David Schifrin, and many others. And now, it's your turn. Experience Leger Reeds at your local music store or by heading to Leger.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E.com. Take your playing to the next level with Bakun Musical Services. With 14-day trials, free shipping on eligible orders, and expert advice, you can be sure you're making the best choice for your musical needs. For Canadian customers, be sure to check out the new store that allows you to pay in Canadian dollars. And for everyone listening, I've got a special coupon for you. You can save 10% on your next barrel, bell, accessory, or even now clarinet purchase at bakunmusical.com. Just use code CLARINET at checkout as a thank you for listening. Again, that's code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com. Welcome back to the Clarinet Podcast. I'm here today with Miles DeCastro, straight from Potsdam, New York. And he is not only the repair technician for the Crane School of Music, but he's also the owner of North Country Winds. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Miles. Uh, John, thanks for having me. Um, I absolutely love the show. I listen to it all the time. And uh, yeah, it's great to be on. Miles. I'm so looking forward to talking to you today because I think that many of the things you can bring to the table are super important for clarinetists. But let's start just with a little bit more about you. And I want to get to know you as a musician a little bit. And how did you get into um, um, instrument repair as a a focus? Like so many technicians, um, I'd say a good 75% of professional repair technicians. It's not my first career. I feel like it's it's just one of those things. Nobody finds it as a first career. And I'm no exception to that. Um, I started out wanting to be a music educator. Uh, went to college for that. Um, primary instrument saxophone, it's like my secret shame, you know, not, 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 <laughs> I didn't, didn't start out as clarinetist. I taught for a year, um, really a uh, horrible school district, um, um, dangerous, no funding. This wasn't a good situation. So I ended up, I just knew I wasn't going back there. I wasn't sure I was done with teaching altogether, but I knew I wasn't going back to that same school district. So I just worked in a music store that I saw had an opening. And that's where I really found out, oh, hey, it turns out that I actually love the industry side of things. You know, I, I'll always have a passion for music education, of course, but I was really surprised to see how interesting I thought that the music industry was. So um, I ended up deciding that um, I'd love to uh, learn about repair. So I actually went to repair school in Renton, Washington, very close to Seattle. And um, I, I really knew that, like, solidified that was a career for me, for sure. So I worked in a shop in Reno for a few years. Then I worked in a shop near um, San Francisco for about four and a half years. And now I've been in Potsdam for a little over four years. And um, and through all that, somehow, I, I, I always say, people ask how I started specializing in clarinet repair. And I tell them, um, I didn't pick the clarinet, the clarinet picked me. <laughs> um, I say, I jokingly say, I blame Steve Sanchez in the San Francisco area, a great player in that area, who came in for some repairs. Um, he was just, a, he was a big fan of what I did. And um, he was so nice to tell other people. And that just really like got the ball rolling. And then people just kept coming to me for clarinet repairs. Um, I developed a great relationship with Matt Coon, um, And it just really kind of snowballed from there. And I love it. I absolutely love working on clarinets. I like working on everything, but I really love specializing in clarinets. Well, we have to stop the interview because if you've played saxophone, you can't be on the podcast. No, I'm just kidding. That's right. I figured. <laughs> I, you know, I almost didn't even say it. You know, I wouldn't wait. <laughs> No, I actually played a bit of sax too, so it's just all good. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, that's. I have a clarinet in my hands ten times more often than I do a sax. 
<laughs> good, good. Now we can proceed. I'm just kidding. You know, I love the fact that you took kind of a negative situation and instead of settling into it, you chose to kind of take that as a sign. And, and I'm a big believer in this, that it's as important to find what you don't want to do as it is to find what you do want to do. But I think that also has to do a bit with people's temperaments. So do you think that that kind of just the way that you are, you're always pursuing what's best for you and what you want or you were pushed in the direction or? Yeah, I think that kind of describes me to a T. Um, that I don't like to settle. You know, I wouldn't want to just like musicians wouldn't want to accept a so-so performance or so-so practice routine. They want to get better at all these things. Um, I don't want to accept that from where I'm at in life or at my repair level. I want to keep getting better and better and better. Um, if I'm in a situation where there's just not the, the resources to help a lot of people, and there's an opportunity where I can help more people and help more musicians, then um, I'm, I'm probably going to go for it. So I feel like that's all kind of what, you know, in sort of a meandering path led me to Potsdam. Love that. So I was going to start with uh, some of the repair stuff, but I think I'd actually rather start with how does someone find a good technician like you then? Someone who's passionate and, you know, does a good job. And uh, when they do find someone like that, how can they foster that relationship and make sure that it, it works for both parties? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always encourage um, musicians, especially high level ones, to uh, talk to their colleagues. So many musicians are, are always playing with other really good musicians or musicians maybe even better than them, and people who have to rely on their instrument 100% to make 100% of their income. See where they're going if you have people like that in your area. Something else, if you're like really, really lost um, and don't know where to go, um, there's an organization called MAPBERT, National Association of Professional Band Instrument Repair Technicians. You can see who's in the organization. Um, there's a misconception that NAPERT does some sort of certification. They don't. Anybody who pays their dues can be a NAPERT member, but at least it kind of tells you that these people are into it. They're constantly, you know, trying to seek out continuing education and go to conferences and find the latest tools and techniques and things like that. So if you really aren't finding anybody in your area that you can um, bounce ideas off of and see how um, what technician they like to go to or anything like that. Um, That's a great, great idea. And so once you do start to find someone that you want to work with, then how can we sort of foster that relationship and make sure that you you're kind of uh, both seeing eye to eye? And, and I always felt, you know, uncomfortable with someone I didn't know working on my instrument, even if they were quite, um, you know, renowned. So once you find that person, you can feel kind of attached to them, you know. So I guess you want to make sure they're kept happy and that you're, you know, because you're happy and you want to make sure that they want to keep working on your instrument too, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I usually say treat it kind of like a rehearsal or maybe even a gig. Even if you're a little bit nervous um, going into the technician, just like maybe if you were nervous going into a rehearsal or a gig, um, try not to show it because that, that all, the only thing that really could happen from that is you're going to you know make the technician nervous or make the technician think, what does this person have trust issues or something like that? You know, of course, it, it's, it's a very natural response when you have something that you've poured your life into and this is your tools for making your living and you're putting it in the hands of somebody else, you know, do your best to, uh, you know, to, to show some confidence and you, that you accept that they know what they're doing. Also like a gig or rehearsal, uh, show up on time. You know, you want to be, <laughs> punctual. be amazed at how many people think that's not an important thing. I would jokingly call it, um, California standard time when I was near San Francisco and um, hardly anybody would show up to their appointment on time and they'd be flabbergasted that I was on to the next appointment when they showed up. And it's like, sorry, sorry, you missed your slot, you know, and I and, and then many would uh, reschedule and they'd be late for that one. And I would just do three strikes. You're out. You can still walk in and drop off your instrument, but don't expect to book an appointment. with me. I just, I just can't get you know, my time like that. That's such good advice. And, you know, so what if you do like if you move or if you want to keep using someone who's in a different state or province and you need to start shipping your instrument, do you have any advice for like, should you maintain that relationship, trying to find a new relationship or do you have advice for shipping your instrument and making sure it stays safe in that regard? Oh, thank, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, um, shipping has improved so much from even a few years ago, how um, with the big companies, you can track exactly where your instrument is at all the time. Um, I get stuff from literally all over the continent, um, from UPS and FedEx, and I have not had one issue in my four years of running North Country Winds um, with any kind of damage whatsoever, um, as long as people follow instructions. I had uh, one person who had damage, uh, very minimal damage, just a couple keys got bent, and he didn't follow the instructions. So I'd say um, ship the instrument in the case, uh, well packaged in a good sturdy box and use one of the big companies like UPS or FedEx. Don't use the postal service. In the United States anyway, it might be better with Canada Post. Everybody who's followed those instructions, we haven't had one issue uh, with a damaged instrument. 
Interesting. And, and what about heat or cold issues? I mean, for example, in Canada here, there's times when it's minus 30. And, and I know in the States, customers are telling me, you know, they're uncomfortable sending their instrument in the heat. But is it really an issue or only an issue the sudden change? Um, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. The sudden change. That's the that's the big thing that gets you. If the instrument isn't getting played in those temperatures, there's a very, very minimal chance that anything really as bad is going to happen. Of course, it would be ideal to keep the instrument consistent, you know, a nice room temperature, a nice 50 percent humidity all the time. If you're shipping the instrument, that's not going to happen. Um, as long as the instrument's not going to get played during that time, which it's not, it's in a box somewhere. The chances are very, very low that anything's going to happen. I have never seen anything happen. We get negative 20 Fahrenheit a few times a year here. I have never seen any issues um, with instruments being out when the temperature is like that. Um, I do recommend usually I'm just like slightly expedited shipping. If you can bump it up to two or three day, make sure you're not shipping over a weekend or a holiday or anything like that. Just less days at the instrument on the road. Yeah, that'd be my advice. But I'd say um, really d don't fear it. If you're really comfortable with a technician, we know how hard those relationships can be to establish. I would say stick with it and don't be afraid to ship it if you need to. And what about, you mentioned keeping it around 50% humidity. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But do these Boveda packs or Boveda packs suffice for that to keep the case in a good state? Or what would you recommend? Yeah, I found that they work really, really well. And um, yeah, that's that's exactly what I use. And I just use them just like the instructions say on them, you know, how it, like, it recommends every few months or whatever it is to get a new one. If people have five, maybe even $10,000 worth of instruments in the case or more, um, if, it's a, if it's a double case, um, don't cheap out on these packs, you know. <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to spend some money to, to buy yourself a few, a few more packs and uh, have them ready to go when you need them. In regards to receiving the instrument back then, you mentioned that with sudden temperature changes, it's a problem. So let's say it's really cold outside and I get my clarinet back. It's been on the road for two or three days. What is a time that I should wait to let it adjust in that period? Um, I would say absolutely give it a few hours and just kind of feel it for when it's up to room temperature. I know you, you finally get your baby back and the first thing you want to do is play it. Try to resist the temptation. Um, to, uh, uh, maybe like, you know, even go to the store and knock out a few emails or something if you uh, if you absolutely have to, um, just to keep yourself away from it. So I'd say give it a few hours and just uh, see, see what it's like and then go through your normal routine. I recommend, you know, putting uh, the barrel and upper joint under the armpit while you're getting your reed ready just to kind of warm up the outside because you're about to rapidly be warming up the inside. So make sure you still, that's one time, you really don't want to neglect that, that whole routine. All right. Well, let's dive into some of the like, big questions here about clarinet repair, because there are many. And uh, I know that people also are always debating these kind of things. It's one of the funny things about the world of clarinet and music in general, I guess, is some of these things kind of become a bit of a, I don't know, like a mythology about them or something. And people become very opinionated one way or the other. So let's start with the big one, the elephant in everyone's clarinet room, cracking. So how do we prevent it? How do we, you know, treat the wood, everything to do with cracking? And if it does crack... How can we fix it? And is it the end of our instrument, the world, you know, life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it may seem that way to some, but uh, but trust me, it, it, it is not. It is not. Um, to give yourself the best chance of preventing it, um, just like we were talking about, it's those sudden changes that you've got to watch out for. Um, you know, do your best to keep it at consistent room temperature, um, as close to 50% humidity as you can. When you start playing it, the crack is usually caused by the, the big change. You're heating up the inside quicker than you're heating up the outside putting more moisture into the inside than is on the outside because you're blowing in. That's how we play this. Thing. So uh, warm up the outside a bit. I, I like to tell people while they're getting the reed on their mouthpiece, put the barrel on the top joint and then kind of put that that section of the instrument under their armpit and just kind of rest there. That's going to give yourself the best chance of the wood not cracking. But sometimes wood just wants to crack and that's just what wood is like. If you really think about how we're making these things out of wood, and then what we do to them, we do virtually the worst thing you could possibly do to them. You know, we immediately change their, we put put a hole in it. That doesn't want to be there. You know, the thing wants to be a tree. It doesn't want to be a clarinet. So it doesn't want this hole in it. It doesn't want this different moisture on the inside than the outside. It doesn't want a different temperature on the inside than the outside. Just gradually introducing the moisture and heat as best you can is always a good idea. Um, uh, if it does crack, take a couple deep breaths. I know that that can be almost a traumatic thing to see. Um, trust me, if, if you send it to a good technician, it will be playing just as well as before it cracked, and it'll be about 95% invisible or so if the instrument um, gets pinned. Um, I like to use carbon fiber pins uh, when repairing cracks, almost always, depending on where the crack is. If the crack is in one of the normal locations, you know, the top of the upper joint, I will almost always go carbon fiber pins 
and um, they're lightweight, so we're changing less things. Um, I feel like they're not as aggressive as the traditional metal pins that people used to use. The, those pins will, will add the stability that it needs, and you'll be back to playing your instrument. Um, I have a colleague at the college, one of the clarinet professors, Julianne Kirk Doyle, and um, she had a crack. She will tell you the instrument played even better after it cracked. It got fixed. And she said, you loved the instrument before and then loved it even more after that. So. Well, that's something I was going to ask you about. I don't know if... Um you have really an answer that's objective to this, but I've heard that the crack releases the tension in the wood and then therefore it resonates better. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> it, it, that totally makes sense to me. I can't prove that's what happens, but it, it certainly stands to reason, I would say. It makes sense to me. And especially Ariane here, she's a phenomenal clarinetist and hearing her say that, that's even more you know, proof. And she has intimate knowledge of this instrument and says that's what happened. I, I absolutely believe it. And I could totally see that being the reason. So is there some level in which people are right, though, that this is the end of the world? Like, is the instrument lost all resale value or now they're going to be super depressed or? <laughs> it definitely lost a lot of resale value, but um, that's just how the market is and how people are. You know, they don't want to buy one that's been cracked when that can be a tremendous value. If you've got a student who's short on dough, and you can um, find a used high quality instrument and in good condition and it's cracked. That's going to drive the price way down, but that's going to create a huge value for the, for the student. And that might be a wonderful instrument for a student who could, couldn't otherwise afford, you know, an R13 or whatever, you know, whatever their first professional instrument is going to be. And so along these same lines, then, in what um, way should one use bore oil and how often and, and why? Is, are you a believer in bore oil? I've heard conflicting opinions on that, too, even. I do recommend uh, oiling the bore. Um, I say do it about four times a year, give or take. Um, around the changing of the seasons, just a little bit on your clarinet swab. I usually recommend people have a special swab just for oiling the bore, separate from their daily swabbing swab. Just a few drops of that, run it through the bore a few times, kind of hold it up to the light and make sure um, make sure you've covered all of the wood inside the bore of the instrument. Um, I usually, on Bakun's website, they have a great um, routine for doing it. I usually just direct people there and say, just follow this. No matter what kind of clarinet you have, um, this is the best routine for doing it. Big question is, does it prevent cracks? There have been a lot of studies where people will try to see how far into the wood they can get the oil to penetrate, either by leaving like a, a scrap body submerged for months and months or put, actually putting it under pressure somehow. And basically all of them have found that the wood clarinets are made out of is so dense the oil barely penetrates. So I think oiling does a lot of good stuff, but I have no idea whether it prevents cracks or not. And um, I have no idea. I bet nobody actually. Um, you know, a lot of people have theories on it. I do think it is good for the instrument, though, because it um, maintains the consistency inside the bore of the instrument. And um, it's also going to give a nice surface for water and everything else to just run out and not be hung up in the bore of the instrument. Well, and that's what Maury told me that kind of was interesting is that the, the point of the bore oil, instead of seasoning the wood, and I don't want to quote him here, maybe I'm misquoting, but, but instead of seasoning the wood, it's more to allow the moisture to escape because the oil of course, doesn't want to mix with the water and then the water wants to get out. So you can tell it's actually time to oil your clarinet if you start getting those bubbles in your keys, because that means the water is not escaping as it should be down the bore. Yep, absolutely. Fully, fully agree with that. So let's talk about another issue then. I mean, that's all, you know, the wood part of the instrument. But what about the keys? A lot of people get kind of a, a reaction on the keys. Or the keys start to deteriorate. And, and this, of course, affects the look of the instrument, which also to me, like I, I guess maybe I'm kind of shallow, but to me, it's important it stays looking good as long as possible. So how can we take better care of our keys and, and uh, different materials and, and just everything to do with keys now? <laughs> Pick your brain in all the best ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, everybody's different. So everybody's going to wear through the keys at a different rate. My wife um, used to play clarinet. Well, actually, she just picked up her clarinet again. So she's been playing it a bit. She goes through the keys quicker than maybe anybody else I've ever met. Um, I actually, uh, when she was getting ready to take up her clarinet again, I actually sent all her keys off to get replated um, when I was, because um, I was, these look, these look terrible, you know, they'll work just fine, but they look terrible. <laughs> um, so everybody's different. If you have more acidic chemical makeup, then you're going to go through it faster. Um, no matter what your chemical makeup is, it will help just wipe down those keys real quick with a soft cloth. Um, I like microfiber for it, but just any plain untreated cloth to get any bits of oil that you can possibly get off of it after you've been touching it with your skin. Whether those keys are going to wear out in 10 years normally or 100 years, um, you're going to lengthen that amount of time. So, um, yeah, a little bit of extra protection for yourself on the, on the key finish. 
But yep, I totally agree. When possible, it should look as good as it sounds. Yeah, because I think that for some people, I found nickel. I go straight through nickel. I don't know what it is, but within a couple of years, if I have a nickel clarinet, you can already start to see the copper below and then it's just stripped down to the bare brass or whatever it is. But if I use silver, I've never had that problem ever. <laughs> and it's super weird. Um, and now I have gold. So I'll have to see how, how that holds up with my my biology. <laughs> That's a great point too. You know, some people might react worse with silver. Some people might react worse with nickel. Yeah, yeah just everybody's chemical makeup is a bit different like that. Totally. And so... We talk a lot about, you know, maintaining the, the keys and the wood. What are some other elements? Of course, there's much more than that. But what are the next kind of starting points for someone to consider, such as springs, pads, like all that kind of stuff? Where should we next be directing our conversation here? Kind of treat your trip to the repair shop like um, like you're supposed to for yourself going to the doctor. You should be going about once a year, whether you're sick or not. So your clarinet, even if you perceive your clarinet is is playing wonderfully, I would still say go in once a year. Chances are there's not going to be a problem that pops up all at once. If you, you know, if you lose 0.01% of its functionality per day, you're not going to notice that from day to day. But after a year or, or longer, your instrument will be leaking and you'll be kind of surprised like, oh, it's leaking. Really? Oh, yeah. And then once it gets fixed, it's, uh, you know, like, oh, yeah, I remember when this was easier to play. That's right. So I would say one of the best things you can do is just get a checkup once a year. You know, your technician might look at it for two minutes and say, you're good to go. And OK, mm-hmm. and you're, then you're done. I would recommend getting a full clean oil and adjust every couple of years. Um, I know some people um, take their own clarinets apart. Um, that, that can really lengthen the time between professional um, clean oil adjusts or COAs, as they're commonly called. But I would recommend getting that done every two or three years on a professional instrument where the instrument is um, completely stripped down. Wood body is probably ultrasonically cleaned. I'm a big fan of ultrasonics for cleaning. It does a really thorough job. And um, you should see the, uh, the liquid after that, after a clarinet that looks pretty clean, how dark that turns with all, all the grime that comes off of it. Um, so you have to get that done every few years. And just like, again, like the doctor, if you're getting sick, don't wait for that yearly checkup. You know, go see a doctor. If um, your instrument isn't feeling right, you know, go see your instrument doctor. Go see your technician. You know, get in there as soon as you can um, to, to get that fixed. There's um, no reason you should suffer with an instrument that's performing less than what it should. The little things you can do on your own. Um, you know, you use plenty of cork grease if it needs cork grease. Don't go cramming the joints together. A mascara brush to clean out your um, open tone holes, that can provide so many benefits. You should see the instruments I get. Almost every single one has build up in, build up in the tone holes. This starts to affect the pitch, of course, right? Exactly, exactly. You've got a smaller tone hole than it was um, that was supposed to be. Um, j- just an incredible amount. I mean, and how often do you really look in there if you're not thinking about it? Of course, you're not going to be like sticking down there, but... Um, just something to get out that grime, you know, I mean, you don't have to do it super often. It probably takes 10 seconds once a month and you'll, you'll keep it nice and clean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That can, in addition to it being unsanitary, yeah, you know, you're affecting the tone hole that's going to affect pitch and response and even affect your timbre. So you mentioned every couple of years for a full overhaul, but if you're an active professional player, is it kind of like more a car where they say to do it every 5,000 miles or by July 31st or whichever comes first? Yeah, I, if you're a working professional, um, at least once a year, I would say. Um, you might want to go in every six months. Um, and, and even if you're playing it, you know, if you're playing gigs every single day, you should be able to go about once a year, typically. Um, but maybe do get it checked up at six months, you know, if you have a week off from your show or something like that. Your, your technician will, if there's nothing wrong, a good technician will say, hey, there's nothing wrong, come back in six months, we'll get it taken care of then. Yeah, if, you, if you're working all the time, you really got to schedule those things in or have a very, very suitable backup set of clarinets. And I don't want to reduce the amount of work that, you know, qualified technicians like yourself get, but there are many instances where a person might benefit from knowing more about repair than they do, or even you're stuck in a situation where you can't get to a repair person. Um, so in these instances, what do you think that a, a exploratory clarinetist or someone who's willing to learn or should learn, what should they do? Should they read a certain book? Should they get some mentoring from someone like you? Is that something that really even happens or what, what's, what should we do <laughs> to better our knowledge? <laughs> It's so tough because it's such a hands-on skill to learn. Um, so, it, so it's really, really tough to, um, to get that knowledge, um, you know, just the little bits and pieces. Um, I would say every clarinet conference or festival you go to, try to seek out a repair clinic. There's almost always one. I do my best to, when I do these things to cram in as absolutely as much knowledge, um, you know, kind of save the day type of uh, tips and tricks um, that I possibly can. That's usually the best way because at least you can see up close and personal what's being done to hopefully a demo instrument and, and something like that. 
beyond that, it's tough. I, w- I wish it was easier um, to get repair training. There's a few videos on the internet, but you, you really got to take those with a grain of salt as to um, you know, what if the person who's showing you this stuff doesn't actually know what they're doing. That can be really tough. I feel like people, like when they see something on the internet like that, kind of throwing it back to what we were talking about earlier, um, they vet the tech 10 times less when they watch a video online than when they actually go to a person for some reason. But they'll almost like take it with like the person that they see online who will rank them just as highly as the technician they go to. And that, I mean, that can be tough. Who knows where this person, anybody can make a video online. Be able to, um, you know, know basically how springs work. Um, you know, sometimes just popping a spring back into its cradle can be all it takes. Um, order yourself a spring hook from musicmedic.com or one of the other suppliers, or even just carry an old crochet hook around and know um, what side of the key that spring is supposed to be on. And know when you're not touching that key, is that key supposed to be sprung down or sprung up? You know, just take a little bit of time and look at your clarinet and, you know, have a, have a good idea of those things. Well, this was actually my next question then. So if we want to bring stuff with us just to have in an emergency, like what are the top five or six things everyone should have in their case to to do some of their own repairs, but also to quickly, you know, replace a pad or or anything like this? Nice. Oh, yeah, that's a a great question. Yeah, uh, spring hook for sure. Um, There's two types of glue um, used for very different types of things. For if a pad falls out and you've got no other choice but to try to put that pad back in yourself, um, you want to get... um, Amber Melt Pellets from a company called JL Smith. Um, their website's jlsmithco.com. Very easy to heat up these pellets and put the put the pad back in. That's going to give yourself the best chance of successfully doing that. Um, now, if you have a key cork or a key felt fall off, you want something called super glue gel. Now, super glue, emphasis on the gel part. Not regular old super glue that's water thin and is going to get all over the place and you accidentally glue yourself to the clarinet or something like that. Forget about regular super glue. This is super glue gel. Um, but just about any hardware store, or um, I've even seen it in the grocery stores um, around here. I would think it's the same for Canada. A company called Loctite makes it. They make all kinds of adhesives. So super glue gel, absolutely, just to stick that key cork or key felt back on. I really like Teflon tape or PTFE tape or plumber's tape, people call it. That can be really good if your cork is just shrunk down too much and your um, your joints are kind of wobbly and not sticking together as well as they should if it's really loose, especially if it's the bell, because any other joint, you're probably going to be able to catch it before it falls, but not the bell if that falls off the end of your instrument. So that can be nice to really build up the size of your cork a little bit and just get yourself a snugger fit on that. Musicmedic.com actually sells emergency repair kits. I think it's around $100 American, maybe even a little less. Then you can buy a little clarinet kit that comes with all kinds of odds and ends um, that give yourself the best chance of, of, of succeeding. You know, it'll have a few pads, some corks. I think it even has like um, maybe a peel and strip cork. If your cork, um, pedding cork comes all the way off, you can put one of those on just to get yourself through the show until you can get it recorked. Yeah, not out of the question to buy a pre-made um, kit from a repair supplier. That is a good idea. And is it worth practicing some of this stuff on like a, a backup instrument or just kind of go big or go home? Yeah, yeah. If you can, that's great. That'd be a great way to do it. If you um, have an instrument that you don't mind, if you screw something up, oh, well, um, yeah, that, that's really great. Just just like anything, just like when you're, you know, getting ready for the gig and you want to practice it, you know, getting ready for that time that you need to repair something. That'd be a great idea to practice it if you can. Well, because I think that's what a lot of people get caught up on is like, I'm comfortable going to a clinic with a kid and repairing his, you know, pad or fixing um, a felt or whatever on his $300, you know, half broken clarinet. But when I look at mine, I'm like, oh God, like I, <laughs> I should feel it's somehow sacred and, and it's got all this, you know, top notch work on it. I don't want to touch it, you know? So I guess that's just a, a something you have to get over, but um, it doesn't feel like an instrument I want to practice on. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. For that stuff. I mean, if you don't have anything to practice on, I would say don't practice on your own. <laughs> stuff, you know, Cause there's a good chance that you won't find yourself in the situation, you know, or a situation where you can't like at least borrow a friend's clarinet or something like that. You don't actually have to go through with the emergency repair. I get emails, random emails from somebody who went to a clinic I did two or three years ago all the time. And I say like this one little tip, I never had to do it. And then, you know, disaster struck right before the concert and I did it. And you know what? It got me through. And I'm like, oh, that's great to hear. I'm so glad that made a difference for you. Well, and do you think that this should be more incorporated into music education? Like I remember I was teaching one summer at, uh, it was called the Air Cadet Program. They had a music thing in a military camp here in Canada, long story short. But part of their education at each level was a maintenance requirement. And at first I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. But as I looked into it more, it was really cool because at the beginning, you basically just had to swab your clarinet. And you, if you couldn't pass your course, if you broke your instrument either. 
So if you broke your instrument, you failed your maintenance requirement, which <laughs> makes sense, you know. But by level five and six, you were actually like called upon to right there on the scene, they'd make you pop off a, a cork or a pad and you'd have to replace it and show that you're competent enough to do this. And the reasoning was like if you're out in the field or you're doing a parade or something with the military band, like you got to just do this. You got to play. <laughs> it's like fixing your gun if you're a, if you're an infantry person, you know. And I always thought that was really smart, but I don't recall having to do that as part of my senior recital. <laughs> it's like, here, bust off this pad and let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really good if you get through, a, you know, get you through your recital and have to do that. Man, that'd be really, that'd be great. Yeah, that's awesome that that was a requirement. I do teach a couple courses at Crane, the Crane School of Music, um, on instrument repair. Uh, music ed majors can take it as an elective, but I do get music business majors in there too, music performance even once in a while. Um, and they all say how useful the class is um, and how it, it should be required. And um, I love when I get a student who is student taught and then they have to come back for one last semester of classes and they take my class. They're like, oh, where was this when I was student teaching? I could have used this stuff a dozen times. So, yeah, it's absolutely one of the most useful things. And, you know, of course, I'm biased because I have a passion for music instrument repair technology. Um, so I'm going to think it's super useful. But it's so great when I hear the music majors tell me this, that, the, how useful they find this stuff. And how this is one of the most useful courses they've ever taken. And, yeah, unfortunately, it's like one of the thing, first things that gets chopped all the time. I have heard that a long time ago it was required at Crane. Um, then they made it an elective. And then I asked about having it offered regularly during the semesters, which they weren't. And we were actually able to do that for a few semesters. And now um, with all the COVID cutbacks, it was one of the first things to get to get cut back. So it's uh, not going to be available in the fall. I, I just right before we started talking, I had a student email me saying he was disappointed that he wasn't going to be able to take it. He was really looking forward to the class. And um, yeah, I, I feel so bad for especially the seniors who just aren't going to be able to ever have that experience. They're so lucky to be able to go to a college that actually offers this course. And now yeah, and then they can't take it. Well, you know, and it's interesting, too, because even if you're listening to this and you're, you know, you're a band teacher or something, I think going to these kind of seminars or you want to be an educator in the future, this will really allow you to budget for your program, too, because if instead of mailing your instrument away every time you need a pad replaced, you can save up and get some more thorough maintenance done maybe once a year on the instrument and spend your budget more effectively. Right. It's not really the best expense of your, your music budget to be sending your instruments away. Um, and maybe even mailing them away every time that they need a spring adjusted. You know, you'd rather get them in tip top working order and, and make a bigger investment less often, perhaps, you know. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. Um, when if you can handle those little um, minor repairs and save up that money that you would have spent and then you can get your bass clarinet overhauled, you know, every five or 10 years or something like that. I mean, that that's a tremendous value for for you and your program, you can really do a world of good, you know, those little things that you can take care of in the band room and then just save that money for the stuff that you need a full repair shop for and spend it to the professionals for that. So as a repair technician, I always like to ask this of people in uh, this industry. I don't know why it just, I think it's because I once worked at a computer store and we would kind of develop these pet peeves about people who didn't maintain their computers <laughs> in the right way. It's like, why are you, why are you eating, you know, uh, Doritos into your keyboard? <laughs> you know, no wonder that's stuck, right? Um, so as a repair technician and someone who sees a lot of instruments, repairs to a high level, what are your kind of pet peeves that people do to their instruments? I mean, swab the darn thing and clean your swab once in a while. And, you know, every every once in a while, you know what? Treat yourself to a new swab. The swabs aren't very expensive, you know. But, you know, running this $17 piece of cloth through this $6,000 instrument, but you've been using the same one for 15 years. It's just like, that's just mind mind blowing. You know, you put, like you wouldn't put, um, you're probably not putting regular gasoline into like a nice sports car or something like that. You know, um, it's just like you've got this nice piece of equipment, you know, treat, treat it well. Get yourself a nice accessory to help take care of it. That the, the buildup in the tone holes um, thing for sure. And then just having a little bit of knowledge, which um, I, I'm not like frustrated with the player about it, just because like we were talking about, it's so difficult to get that knowledge. But you just get frustrated when it's something minor, like a springs off its cradle or something like that. And it's just I wish there were more resources out there where this person just could have had this knowledge to take care of it themselves. I wouldn't be disappointed at all about losing the small amount of money that I charge on something like that. I would much rather have this musician have been able to keep playing you know, their instrument and then, and then they can bring it to me when it really needs something done. Yeah, it helps you manage your time more effectively, too, if you're able to do the work that you're best at and kind of um, can bring the player's instrument to a new level instead of fixing these kind of micro problems that are are so easily adjusted. Um, what about if you ever seen people attempting to do repairs they probably shouldn't have? Uh, yeah, yeah, all the time. Um, see uh, plier marks um, on the keys. Um, 
they think it's so simple. It's something got um, got bent. Oh, all I have to do is um, bend it back. And and for the most part, that's that's not inaccurate actually. Um, that that is essentially what's going to be done to it. There's going to be a few more things to that, making sure the key height's still okay and the pad's still seating and all that good stuff. They might have it basically right, and then they just grab it with the absolute wrong tool. You know, um, buyers with um, serrated jaw, so they have like the teeth in them, and it's just like you just marked up that key, and that key is marked up forever. There is nothing that can be done to. Um, reasonably done to undo that so um yeah just um yeah people getting a little too heavy-handed with it i feel like like there's a range of like a lot of people are like too timid to try anything and then there's a few people who are like too overzealous and they go for too much you know <laughs> like um and yeah. like like splitting the difference um kind of thing so yeah yeah attempting, attempting something you're just not equipped for well and you know you got to know your limits right but also it reminds me of that uh i wish i could remember exactly the story but i think it was something to do with ibm computers they hired some guy because they couldn't figure out something with their system. And the guy came in and it was a really important system. I don't remember if it was military or a bomb or whatever, but it was like, if it was done wrong, lives were at stake, right? So they had this guy come in and he basically just came in, went straight over, like pushed a button and gave him the, the invoice. And it was for like a big amount of money, like let's say $20,000. And they were like, this is insane. All you did was push a button. So he said, oh, okay, you're right. He changed his invoice. It said, button pushing $1, knowing which button to push. Nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. I've never written it on an invoice, but, you know, I have said, you know, a dollar to hit it. Thirty nine dollars because I knew where to hit it. Exactly. That's exactly what it comes down to. So before we leave today, I wanted to ask you, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss? We didn't get the chance to go over. I guess I'm um, buying new instruments. If you can do that where you go to your trusted technician, because they're going to give you just as good of advice when it comes to when it's time to purchase a new instrument. You know, like we said, these things are made of wood. They don't last forever. So if you can really work with your technician and then if your technician is in the same shop that you're buying the instrument from, they can tweak it to your liking, especially if you have an established relationship. They're going to know exactly how you like things. They'll do a lot for you. If um, you, know, you treat your technician well, well, they will always go the extra mile for you. I love that. And you know what? Getting maintenance and good maintenance for your instrument, it will extend the life of your instrument, the life you can own it and the resale value. So um, not to mention your performance. So if these things matter, we're going to have a financial wellness episode coming up soon. But uh, it's one thing I want to talk about is like maintaining your sort of golden goose or something. So we'll go into that in some other episode. But you do want to make sure your instrument stays in good shape and uh, can take care of you as well as a performer, right? So if you're listening to the Clarity Podcast here on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get the podcast for free, this is where the episode will end. So thank you so much to Miles for coming on today. But if you're listening on Patreon for as little as $1 a month at clarinet.com slash subscribe, you're going to get access to a couple of little bonus questions called the lightning round. So thank you so much, Miles, and we'll see you on the other side for listeners for the lightning round questions in the Patreon community. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. If you'd like to send me a guest suggestion, have some feedback, or just want to say hi, you can contact me directly at feedback at clarinet.com. And if you listen this far, you are a true fan, and I want to invite you to the Patreon community. Oh, we got a car passing here. That's a oh, nice Porsche, actually. It's pretty loud, though. I hope you didn't hear that in the microphone. But anyway, um, <laughs> remember, this studio is my house. Um, I want to invite you to the Patreon community, though, because you can get access in there from $1 per month to extended ad-free episodes. And I want to give a special thank you and shout out to those who are contributing more than $10 a month to help make the show possible. We've got Robert W., Glenn K., David S., William L., Miguel D., Debbie A., Patty S., and Josh, and oh, and Karen D. Thank you so much all for your support. Also, thank you to our sponsors. We've got Bakun Musical Services. You can now use your code Clarinet for 10% off anything at their online store, including their clarinets. If you're looking to upgrade, this would be an excellent chance to get a great value on a new instrument. Check it out at bakunmusical.com and don't forget to use code Clarinet. We also have Legere Reed sponsoring the show and you should check out their social media and website because they have a new Reed case that's reusable and holds all of their Reed sizes that will be coming with their products starting in October, I believe. And also in October, they're launching their new European signature bass clarinet Reed, which has been a long time in the making and people have been waiting for it for a long time after the success of their original European signature Reed, which many players, including myself, love to use. Um, you can check it out again at Legere.com or your local music store by the website website is l-e-g-e-r-e dot -E -E or their Instagram page, which is at Legere Reads. And last but not least, we have Encoda. It's an app kind of like Netflix or Spotify, but for sheet music. And you can get a free trial today at Encoda.com. That's N-K-O-D-A dot com. 
Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists.